Hello, welcome to the SETI Colloquium series. I'm Matija Chuk, and today we have a special event. Today is anniversary of an event that happened in 1908 in central Siberia. There was a huge explosion on June 30th, new style calendar, uh, close to Podkamene Tunguska River in Siberia that leveled large uh, area of the forest and uh, we think that has been that that was the largest extraterrestrial impact during recorded history and that because of that June 30th is now popularized as the asteroid day and we have asteroid theme talks today we are fortunate that at our institute we have world-class experts on asteroids so we're gonna hear two talks that will concern um, plans to go out and get them literally um, <laughs> <laughs> and first, uh, Michael Bush, an expert on uh, radar observations of asteroids, will tell us about the ARM project. Uh, and uh, after him, uh, Peter Yeninskins, expert on asteroids and meteorites, will talk about the Shepard project. We'll take questions after both talks are done, otherwise uh, people online would not be able to hear the questions. Michael? Okay. So I'll be talking about characterizing targets for NASA's asteroid redirect mission. Before I do that, I'm going to explain what ARM is and why NASA is doing it, at least in overview. And for this, I'm lifting shamelessly from talks by Dr. Michelle Gates at NASA headquarters, who is the director of the ARM project. So the idea for the asteroid redirect mission is to launch a robotic spacecraft. You go to an accessible near-Earth asteroid. The idea is to launch 2019 to 2020 on the current mission schedule. You pick up a large blocker boulder from the asteroid surface. You lift it up back into space. And you return this sample, which notionally is a couple of times the mass of the spacecraft, back to Earth-Moon space. High lunar orbit is favored because it's a convenient place to park things where it won't pose a hazard to any other spacecraft. And that would get back to lunar orbit in the mid-2020s, and then astronauts go up from the ground and examine it. This relies on high-power solar electric propulsion. So you see here this bluish glow behind the spacecraft in the computer-generated imagery. What that is is high-energy plasma shooting out the back of the spacecraft. So this is not a conventional chemical rocket. Instead, you ionize a gas, typically the xenon for the arm design, you run the resulting protons and electrons through a large electrical voltage. This accelerates them to very high speeds, of course, them out the back of the spacecraft. This is very efficient in terms of the amount of momentum you can get with a given mass of fuel, which allows ARM to go all the way out there, pick up this block, and bring it back with a spacecraft that masses about five tons, and then between 10 to 13 tons of xenon fuel, depending on exactly where you want to go. The disadvantage of this is that it takes a long time to apply that velocity change, very slow acceleration, even with very large solar panels providing you the electrical power for the system. So solar electric propulsion has been used very successfully before. A good current example is the Dawn spacecraft in orbit around Ceres. This is an order of magnitude bigger than any system that has currently flown. And then you need to bring this back to lunar orbit. And again, the astronauts play with it. So why does NASA want to do this, move large blocks of asteroid around? The primary motivation here is human exploration. NASA has mandate to expand human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit. People talk about sending astronauts to the moon again. People talk about sending astronauts beyond Earth-Moon space. So potentially to Mars, near-Earth asteroids. You can talk about the moons of Mars. In order to do this, we need to test new hardware. And ARM is a way to do that. We bring this pile of material back to lunar orbit. We park it there. The astronauts come up in the new Orion spacecraft, and they can play around with the asteroid material. This lets you test out all of the equipment you'd use to send humans to deep space, to near-Earth asteroid destinations, in an environment where they can get back to Earth in about three and a half days if something goes really wrong. Whereas if you're out on an asteroid in person, it might be six months to get home. And there's not yet enough confidence in the life support system of the new spacecraft 
You also worry about radiation from solar wind, and solar flares, and so on, for all missions beyond low Earth orbit. So this is a way to test the technology that we'll need to do the, for the future missions in deep space in a relatively safe way. Another big interest is in demonstrating this high power solar electric propulsion. If you can take 30 metric tons of material from an asteroid and bring it back to lunar orbit, you can take 30 metric tons of material from Earth orbit and fly it over to Mars very efficiently. So this high power solar electric propulsion is very attractive for designing human Mars missions because you can relatively affordably pile all the supplies that the humans would need in Mars orbit before the humans even leave the ground. So that's primary motivation. There is also a impact hazard asteroid deflection motivation. As Matthias said, today is the 107th anniversary of the Tunguska impact, where a asteroid a bit bigger than this building came in and flashed in the sky and flattened an area of trees the size of a city. Larger asteroids hit the Earth less often, but they can do more damage. There's a survey program by NASA to find and discover all those asteroids, track them, and if whatever small percentage chance, there's one that's going to hit the Earth in the next 100 years or so, we'll want to deflect it. There's a few different ways we know how to do that. One of them is called the gravity tractor. This sounds like something out of Star Trek, but it's fairly straightforward. We have the asteroid out in space. It has its own gravitational field. It's very weak. But we put our spacecraft here. We're getting very slowly pulled towards the asteroid. We can use the solar electric propulsion, angle the rocket exhaust so that it misses the asteroid surface, and then we hover. So rocket exhaust going that way, spacecraft is here, spacecraft has acceleration that way, balanced out by acceleration of the asteroid this way. Newton's third law says that the asteroid itself is also going to go this way. And we very slowly move this entire mountain sideways. This is a very slow, very well controlled process. ARM would pick up this large pile of rocks first, because that's the primary goal of the mission, and because the more mass you have, the more gravity the asteroid is pulling on you with, and the more acceleration you can impart to it with the gravity tractor. So ARM picks up the rock, hovers around the asteroid for a couple of months, and pulls it several hundred meters to one side. So we're moving a mountain by standing next to it and using our own gravity to pull it off course. This is basic Newtonian mechanics. It just hasn't been demonstrated the actual flight project yet. So it's integrated into the ARM mission plan. All of the ARM targets have no chance of hitting the Earth in the next several hundred years. We aren't going to create an impact hazard while demonstrating how we can mitigate the impact hazard. But we will demonstrate that we can move asteroids around in a controlled way. There are science motivations for ARM. Near Earth asteroids are a diverse population. We go to an object that we haven't, have or have not been before, to before. We get a large sample. If we have 30 tons of material, I'm sure we can figure out some good science to do with it. Peter will talk more about that in his half of this, but you can start studying asteroid material properties, internal structures relevant to history of planet formation, evolution of the asteroid built over the last four billion years, and so on. Finally, there's something that's attracted some corporate interest. This is space resources. So it's expensive to send spacecraft up. And any resource that you can get up in space is something you don't have to lift from the ground. That's good. So there's deep space industries here in Mountain View and planetary resources over in Seattle. They would like to take some of the ARM sample after NASA is done with it and do experiments as to how to make useful products. One example is water. If you have an asteroid, it may have a few percent water chemically bonded into the material. It's not ice. It's water chemically bound. But if you heat it up to about as hot as you can get your oven in your kitchen, you end up with an asteroid and a cloud of steam. If you can figure out a way to condense that steam out somewhere else, put it into a tank, now you have a bunch of water. You can use that for fuel. If you have humans around, you can use it for life support. Or you can just talk about making sandbags and strapping them to the outside of your spacecraft. This is a very primitive product, but it's very effective radiation shielding, which is otherwise very expensive to get. So you sometimes hear of people mining asteroids for platinum. That's not a profit-making enterprise yet. The focus here is on resources for use in space. Water and sandbags are fairly basic products, but in space, where everything is a million dollars a kilogram to put it in Mars orbit, for instance, or a few thousand a kilogram to put in low Earth orbit, anything you can get up there already is valuable. So ARM will not 
do that on a very large scale, but it provides enough materials to start demonstrating the technology, which you could use f further out. So that's the motivation. Where is ARM going to go? So there were two versions of the asteroid redirect mission that were originally proposed. One version was what we call option A, or grab a whole block. So there are near-Earth asteroids that are small enough to fit inside this room. And some of them are in very accessible orbits. So the idea was that you would have the spacecraft, solar panels, and the, sol the solar electric propulsion system here. And then you have this large inflated structure supporting a bag. People made jokes about getting endorsements from garbage bag manufacturers and so on. But you'd use the same material that you use for Martian lander airbags or something similarly durable because it has to survive in the space environment and not rip. You match the asteroid's rotation as best you can, come up along that axis, pull the bag tight, and fly home. The other option is option B, where you touch down on the surface, grab this block with these robotic arms, squeeze it to make sure it's not going to break apart, pick it up, and fly it back. So both option A and option B were carefully studied. Option A has the advantage that there are more small asteroids than there are big ones. So you have targets on more accessible orbits. You can bring back more material. Option B has the advantage that we've got better data characterizing the target objects because they're easier to find and easier to observe in detail. Option B was selected because there was lower mission risk assigned to that. It's very hard to get the mass of a small asteroid remotely. So you might go up there, and your spacecraft is designed to bring back 100 tons of asteroid, and it turns out it masses 150 tons. And then you can't bring it back. Oops. Whereas with option B, you're going to a large asteroid. We know it has lots of blocks on its surface. You can pick and choose until you get one of exactly the right mass. And the ARM design includes the option of grabbing up, up to a half a dozen rocks, figuring out how much they mass by moving them around a little bit, and if they're too big, dropping them and going off and picking up something else. So we want to understand as much as we can about these asteroids before we launch the ARM mission. How do we do that? This gets into the question of more general asteroid science. There are a whole bunch of techniques involved here. The first thing is we have to discover the asteroids. This has been almost entirely done by ground-based optical surveys, although there's been some success with infrared observations from space. So here you see the Catalina Sky Survey Telescope over in Arizona. They survey large areas of the sky every night, look for anything that moves. If it's on a near-Earth asteroid orbit, they flag it and report it to the International Astronomical Union, and then that gets disseminated worldwide within a matter of hours. And then everybody else tries to do follow-up observations to make sure we don't lose the object, so we have to know its orbit very well to predict where it's going to be in the future, and then try to characterize its physical properties. We want to know what asteroids are made out of. Some are silicate material, some are rocky, is it rocky material, some are metal, some are called carbonaceous chondrites, so they've got rocks and carbon and some water all bonded together. We can get some information on that for the spectroscopy in the visible into the near-infrared, measuring the different colors of light and how much they're reflected by the asteroid surface. So here you see one place that does that. This is the infrared telescope facility out in Hawaii. We'd also like to know how big these objects are. There's a couple ways to do that. One that's been very successful is the Wide Field Infrared Space Explorer. So this is a small telescope about this big in Earth orbit. It was originally designed strictly for astrophysics, but then they realized that if you survey the entire sky at about 10 microns wavelength, everything at about the Earth's distance from the sun is at about the same temperature as the Earth, give or take some tens of degrees Celsius. And that means they're emitting quite a lot of light at 10 microns. So WISE ended up being extremely good for detecting both near-Earth and main belt asteroids. And so they observe the asteroid. And you observe it in the infrared, as well as in the visible. You can tell how big it is. <coughs> Two objects, one dark and one lightly colored, they might have the same visible brightness because the, visible, the light colored one is reflecting more light. But in the infrared, the dark colored one will show up much more strongly because it's absorbed so much more energy and is re-radiating it back as heat. So WISE can get, give us sizes on a large number of objects. Final technique for getting information on asteroids from the ground 
is radar astronomy. This is stuff that I am involved with. You see here the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. We have a high power transmitter mounted up there. Bounce the radar beam off. It goes out to the target, and we look at the radar echo. That gives us extremely accurate knowledge of where the asteroid is, how fast it's moving. Very good for predicting future motions. Very good if you want to send a spacecraft there in 10 years. Also gives us information on sizes, shapes, spin states, and crucially for ARM, if our resolution is good enough, we can actually see individual blocks sitting on the surface. So we've looked at several hundred asteroids with Arecibo, a couple of thousand with WISE. We know of currently just under 13,000 near-Earth asteroids total, discovered by the survey programs. And that number keeps going up. We're discovering about 1,500 a year. So how do we triage this list down to a short list of the best targets for ARM? ARM has a certain number of requirements for the mission. You want your return to mass to be big, because the goal of this project is to get a large amount of asteroid material to play with up in Earth orbit. If you have to go out to the asteroid and come back, and you only bring back one kilogram, that's very useful for science, but it's not useful for testing all the gear for interacting with large masses of material. You have to be able to get to the asteroid and get back within the schedule constraints of the mission. Again, that's launch around 2020 get back to Earth about five years later. The ARM team tells us that they prefer carbonaceous asteroids, these things with a certain amount of water and carbon compounds mixed in with the rock. Those are good for space resources. They're also interesting because they've been chemically un unaltered since the early solar system. So they give us probes into the formation environments of planets. And then they want as much information as possible before ARM launches. So there's currently four options for picking up a block. And there's the list, 2008 EV-5, Bennu Idokawa 1999 JU-3. I apologize for the telephone numbers. With 13,000-ish near-Earth asteroids, we have not given them all cool names. So we give them telephone numbers based on when they were discovered. So this one was discovered in the first part of 2008. And then this one was discovered a bit later in the year in 1999. Eventually, they'll get names, I'm sure. So what do we know about these objects? 2008 EV-5 is currently the favored target for ARM, which makes me happy because I studied it a lot. We have radar imaging from 2008. Shortly after the asteroid was discovered, it came near the Earth. It'll come near the Earth again in 2023-2024, which is about the time that ARM would like to be returning things, so that's convenient. You see here a radar image. The radar light's coming from above. Can you all see that dot that I marked with the arrow? So that dot is a block sitting on ev 5 surface. We can see it high standing relative to the surrounding surface as it pokes up above the edge of the asteroid. So we don't see any other surface here because it's effectively below the horizon, but that block stands up high enough that we can see it. And it's about 10 meters across. We see a bunch of those blocks on EB-5 surface. We see from the radar scattering properties, there's a lot of 10 centimeter scale cobbles. We infer that there should be a lot of blocks in between those two sizes. The asteroid's overall shape is this 400 meter spheroid. has a ridge aligned with the equator. That's a pretty typical structure among near-Earth asteroids. They're piles of rubble, reaccumulated collisional debris. And if you spin them up, they bulge out around the equator to accommodate the extra angular momentum. Composition is this carbonaceous chondrite mix. It has a bit of iron minerals mixed in, or so Vishnu Reddy and company say, based on infrared work. So we think it looks a bit like this meteorite, which landed in Uruguay in France a long while ago. And so that's this nice black color it tells, is, is all that nice carbon compounds mixed in with the rocks. An arm could bring back about 32 tons of EV-5 to lunar orbit, according to the current plan. So you launch one unit of spacecraft, you get back two units of EV-5. Nice large block for the astronauts to play with. So this is the current favored arm target. There are three others, some of which have already been visited or will be, vis or will be visited by spacecraft. Bennu, which looks like this based on radar data, it is not actually this color. The color coding here is slope on the surface. So these areas are relatively flat. There's a large block sitting up here which is obviously got high slopes. 
You don't want to land on this large block. It's too big to bring back. You want to go around the equator because you have these huge solar wings hanging out on the sides of the armed spacecraft, and you don't want them to tilt sideways and run into a block while you're picking things up. NASA is also sending in a spacecraft called Osiris Rex to Bennu, which will launch in 2016. You see here the spacecraft getting assembled as of a few months ago. Things are significantly more complete now. Osiris Rex will pick up only a small container of stuff from Bennu, but it's going to bring it back to the ground, which is a lot harder than bringing things back to lunar orbit. But starting in late 2018, we'll have very, very much more detailed pictures of Bennu from Osiris Rex. So we'll know a lot more about it. We know that it's a pile of rubble. It's actually about one gram per cubic centimeter, which means that it's actually a very large fraction of empty space inside that pile of rubble. What that means for ARM going in there and finding a block that's cohesive enough and solid enough to bring back is not entirely clear. But we'll get spacecraft data starting in 2012, sorry, 2018, so a couple of years now and before ARM would launch. And then you can bring back only about 12 tons. It's not quite as good as ED5, but you still get about the same amount of material as the spacecraft launch. Number three is the asteroid Itokawa. You'll notice a bunch of stuff written in Japanese here. The Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft visited Itokawa in 2005. It landed over in here, picked up some dust from the surface, and dropped it into the middle of the desert in Australia. And now it's getting analyzed atom by atom. So we know a lot about Itokawa. We know all the blocks on the surface. You can pick and choose everything on that surface that's small enough that ARM can bring back. It's not quite as good as Bennu, but there's a lot less risk here because we have so much data to begin with. So there's this constant trade-off between how much new stuff you are able to learn and how risky you're willing to make the mission. And NASA spends lots of time on every mission arguing about what exact choices to make in that regard. So this one is a bit less good than even Bennu is. You can only bring back six tons, which is half the mass of your spacecraft, but it's very well characterized to begin with. And there's one more where we'll have a bunch more data. JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, has invested in near-Earth asteroid work in a very large way. They have launched a second spacecraft, Hayabusa 2, working with collaborators in Europe and to some extent here in the US. That spacecraft launched last December. And it's currently on its way to an asteroid called 1999 JU3. I don't have any high-res pictures of JU3 to show you because the spacecraft is still en route. We can say it's about a kilometer wide, so significantly bigger than the others. And it won't be until 2018 that we'll get data from Hayabusa 2. But assuming there are good blocks on JU3's surface, ARM can bring back about 13 tons from here as well. And it's got a bit different carbonaceous composition than Bennu or 2008 EV5. It may have some clays mixed in there. So right now, EV-5 is the favorite target for ARM. That may change as more data comes in over the next few years. And we do keep discovering more targets. So there are some additional possibilities for picking up boulders. They have their telephone numbers. One is called 2011-UW-158. We'll get radar observations of this one starting in about two weeks down at Goldstone in Southern California and at Arecibo. This one may spin too rapidly for the asteroid retrieval mission. The larger ones I've been showing you spin every few hours, so they're held together mostly by gravity. This one spins every 30 minutes, which means it's having a certain amount of cohesion. And it's not obvious that you could easily put the armed spacecraft down on the surface and pull off a block. But we'll take a look at it. We'll figure that out. There's another possibility for ARM. 2009 DL46, it's coming back 2016. We'll look at it then. Now, option A for ARM, we the grab the whole one version, we did look at some targets there. And these are small asteroids. They would fit in this room if you cut them into the appropriate size pieces. 2003 EC20 is about this big, give or take. And it's between 20 and 40 tons. This is the problem. It's hard to design a spacecraft that can handle that factor of four variation in mass. And you have to design for the extreme upper bound, because otherwise you can't be sure you'll be able to bring back the asteroid. So if we can design a more capable spacecraft than the current ARM design, we might be able to go to these objects as well. 
And we find more potential ARM targets each year. So we'll keep adding to that list. And we can, of course, find targets that are attractive somewhat further out in the future than the current ARM schedule. And we can ask the question then, what do we want to do after ARM? We do this one mission. We test out equipment. The space resources people, in particular, say we should keep bringing back asteroids so that they can keep experimenting and developing space-based economy. That's outside any planning horizon that I am willing to commit to. But we can start asking the question, what would we want to do after ARM? And Peter is going to be talking about one possibility about that. So I'll switch over to him. So Shepard, Shepard was um, uh, conceived as um, uh, a, you know, a possible future for ARM, a possible way of uh, doing this asteroid uh, redirect mission in a, in a practical manner. And early in uh, uh, this year, in March, we uh, f had this paper published in uh, the journal New Space, which is a very appropriate journal for coming up with this somewhat futuristic idea. Um, it, um, it's really, uh, at its root, very simple. And the idea is that uh, an, an asteroid in microgravity uh, can be manipulated by gases. You can use gases to manipulate an asteroid. And where this idea comes from is um, I was uh, probably best known for uh, ha helping recover these uh, little pieces of an asteroid that was seen coming in, asteroid 2008 TC3. This happened back in, in 2008. And the asteroid was studied in space. We have the shape of it. We even have the orientation in which this asteroid uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and it hit in the, in the north of uh, Sudan, over the Nubian Desert. And this is what was seen by uh, people along the Nile. This was uh, photographed by uh, cell phones, <laughs> even filmed. It was very bright because the impact happened just before dawn, in, uh, in, in morning, uh, just before morning twilight. A lot of people were on and about. Um, this is your asteroid. Most of this asteroid was deposited in the atmosphere. Just a scrap of it survived. This was a very frail asteroid. The highest, the biggest uh, um, moment of breakup happened at uh, 37 kilometers altitude. And, uh, and the, the last little poof was at 33 kilometers. So until that point, nobody had ever recovered meteorites from something that broke apart that high in the atmosphere. And uh, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, my point of contact, uh, Maui Shadad, uh, an astronomer in, uh, in Sudan at the University of Khartoum, turned out to be a really good organizer. And he brought uh, his students with me into the desert, and we went looking, and we actually found pieces of it. And this was the, the first one I found, very excited about it. Uh, what struck me uh, from the very beginning was that the, the meteorites the students were finding, so we had uh, all the students lined up in a row and we were just sort of combing the desert along the path that was calculated. The meteorites that the students were finding were all different. Every time when a rock was presented to me, it looked different. And that was a stunning uh, thing, because normally with meteorite falls, pieces look alike. Uh, there is such a thing as type specimen, where you have one, you know, one meteorite characterizing you know, what came down in that fall. Th there was no type specimen for TC3. <laughs> there are at least 10 different meteorite types that uh, this uh, little asteroid contained. And all these things were in this uh, little uh, asteroid. So uh, this thing uh, was uh, very complex, which makes it a really interesting little world to go and visit. So one of uh, Michael's targets, you know, for me, uh, a great target would be asteroid TC3 when it was still in space. <laughs> because, you know, you would see the asteroid, you could see all these rocks in context. You could study the geology, you could use that to understand the processes in the early uh, solar system uh, that resulted in this weird uh, object. Uh, the other thing was, uh, you know, TC3 was a fragile object, it was a frail object, and there's a lot of frail objects coming into the Earth's atmosphere. And a not a lot of that is recovered on the ground as meteorites. Uh, with TC3, we found some material that was uh, basically a very loose agglomeration of little dust specks, just a little a pile of tiny dust grains on top of each other. That type of materials don't typically make it through the Earth's atmosphere. In this case, you know, there was a big object. This thing was four meters in size. So even when just the scrap survived, we had these interesting materials on the ground. 
but that's, uh, that's not what's, what's typically in, in our meteorite collections. And so when we go out in space and when we visit one of these asteroids, uh, we can find materials that we are not uh, familiar with in our meteorite collections. And the most interesting ones, of course, are those that are really fragile, that are really frail. And a lot of it could be, uh, a lot of asteroids could, could be dominated by that type of materials. So um, ARM was just introduced by Michael. Uh, the idea was to, uh, you know, uh, bring one of these small asteroids closer to Earth so we could actually visit it with people. Um, the original ARM option A uh, idea was um, throw a bag around it, <laughs> uh, grab it, hug it up to the satellite, and then uh, transport it to the Earth. And uh, the you know trouble you get into if you try and do that is that the asteroid is spinning and tumbling, and so if you throw back around the asteroid, it will it will turn the asteroid around. It will want to spin the whole vehicle, and so you lose contact with Earth. Uh, you may tear apart the, uh, the fabric of your bag. Uh, but what for me was much more of a problem was that you will tear apart the asteroid. <laughs> If the rock is fragile, if it's like a loose agglomeration, something like TC3, you're going to end up with a bag of rocks instead of uh, you know, an asteroid that ast astronauts can go to. And uh, it was because of this criticism uh, that was raised early uh, that we started thinking about this problem. And I was wondering, isn't there a way to somehow uh, you know, do this right? This is sort of the information we have on the strength of asteroids. This comes from meteor observations. So these are, uh, if you talk about a few meter size asteroids, you're really talking about one of my objects. <laughs> this, this is the type of objects we are studying. We, lo we see these things hit the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, they, are, uh, they are very enigmatic. We've never seen one close up. Nobody, none of you have. Uh, there could be, uh, interesting new physics in these rocks to be learned. Just like when we went to asteroid Itukawa, which was a sort of a 100 meter size asteroid, that thing was a lot smaller than any asteroid that had been visited before. And sure enough, suddenly this thing turned out to be a rubble pile instead of you know uh, something monolithic looking. And uh, that uh, led to a lot of new insights. So who knows, if we, see an as if we see one of these rocks that we are seeing coming into the Earth's atmosphere up close when it's still intact, everything is, we may find interesting things. And one of the more, in more important uh, interesting things is what is responsible for the inherent weakness of these rocks? Because when we look at these things coming in the Earth's atmosphere, they typically tend to sort of break apart. We see them fragment at uh, pressures of about 100 to 1,000 uh, kilopascal. And to give you an idea, if you touch your skin, just gently, that is one kilopascal. <laughs> so 100 times that, and your rock falls apart. So um, these, these meteoroids, these small meteoroids, are intrinsically fragile. And this is an upper limit, because if the rock is really a lot frailer, <laughs> then as meteor astronomers, we have a hard time seeing that, because uh, the rock may fall apart <coughs> early on, but then everything just moves along uh, uh, with uh, just as one object before it really uh, starts separating and, and uh, breaks up the bigger chunks, the more strongest chunks. There's always a range of there's always a range of strength in these things. So uh, so asteroids are fragile, and especially if these things are rubble pile asteroids. This is sort of the information we have from uh, studying asteroids in space. Uh, this uh, you know asteroids are. Uh, Asteroids are a microgravity type of an object. Don't think about people visiting an asteroid as in, you know, walking on uh, an asteroid surface. That's not going to happen. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the surface of an asteroid, uh, we're really talking about a micro g in terms of uh, gravitational uh, uh, acceleration. And so, uh, no walking, okay? <laughs> Uh, if your asteroid is, uh, is small enough, then even gravity is not the thing that holds the rock together. It's the Van der Waals forces between tiny dust grains. So we think that a lot of these rocks, especially the rubble piles, are sort of held together in this, uh, in, in this uh, concrete of just tiny particles that, uh, that attract each other by Van der Waals forces. And, uh, and that type of material can have a really low strength, as low as 25 uh, Pascal, for example. So this is some uh, uh, calculations by Dan Shears and collaborators where uh, he's arguing 
that asteroid TC3, just the size it is, four meters, could be, uh, and the way it was spinning, we could see it tumble in space, asteroid TC3 could have been an object held together with an internal cohesion of only 25 pascals. So a thousand pascals is touching your skin. <laughs> 25 pascal is as much cohesion as there is in, a, in, in one of these asteroids. It's a lower limit, so something above that. So clearly, you know, we have four orders of magnitude uh, uncertainty in the strength of these asteroids. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's fascinating. Okay, so we need to know and we need to learn about that because it's this sort of objects that is um, giving us our Chelyabinsk. The big impact in Chelyabinsk, you know, was a 20 meter size object. We're talking about small, small things. So if you're talking about asteroid mining, and I just picked these pictures at random from the internet, <laughs> do not think along these lines. This is just, you know, not real. <laughs> this, is this is not uh, the way things can happen. You cannot bolt a, a structure onto an asteroid. Uh, certainly not an asteroid that will be accessible to us in the near future, because they're all going to be small. Uh, if you want to drag an asteroid uh, to the Earth by throwing cables around it and so on, chances are that debris is going to go everywhere and uh, it's going to fall apart on you. And so the first thing, the very first thing in our opinion that uh, we need to be doing is we need to figure out how to put an enclosure around an asteroid. We need to control this problem. We need to figure out how can we build uh, how can we uh, prevent this asteroid from going anywhere if we handle it? And that brings me to, you know, a nice uh, sunny day uh, here in San Jose when I met uh, over a, a cup of clam chowder, Bruce Damer. Uh, Bruce is much more of a futuristic thinker than I am. Uh, Bruce uh, had these, he's a, he, he, he designs uh, space architectures and then develops these uh, fantastic digital products that show how uh, this might work in space. And uh, Bruce had this, uh, this wonderful vision about one day putting an enclosure around an asteroid to collect its volatiles. So what Michael was talking about, you heat the asteroid, water vapor comes out, and you use the water vapor as a source of fuel. I was a little skeptical, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, he, Bruce was talking about icy objects, and most of the asteroids that come anywhere near the Earth or in orbits that are accessible uh, don't have, you know, that much volatile, they certainly have no ices, and so uh, there is mineral water, but then you have to, you know, heat the rock, and uh, there's a less of it, and so, uh, you know, talking with him, I was, uh, you know, uh, being very amused and sort of listening to the stories, and then I was thinking, this is just, you know, not practical, this is not going to happen in my lifetime. But uh, then, uh, I suddenly uh, realized that, hey, wait a second, if you can put an enclosure around your asteroid, then you can fill that enclosure up with gas. And uh, gas, uh, xenon gas to be specific, is the gas that is being provided by, uh, uh, as, a, as a fuel to the ARM mission. So ARM was supposed to bring 10 tons or so, uh, Michael just mentioned 13 tons, of this xenon gas along, so that you can uh, push the asteroid back uh, to uh, where you want it to be, so you can redirect it. If you can just spare, say, two tons of that xenon gas to fill up an enclosure around your asteroid, uh, then suddenly uh, you can de-spin the asteroid. You can stop the asteroid from spinning, uh, even you know when the asteroid is pretty sizable. So at the time they were talking about you know up to 13 meters in size. So if you have a, a, a rock 13 meters in size, you would need an enclosure of about at least 20 meters, 19, 20 meters. And then uh, you could fill that back with, say, two tons of xenon gas. What that does is it raises, uh, it creates an atmosphere of 0.1, it creates a, a, a gaseous atmosphere of 0.1 atmosphere of pressure. So we're talking 0.1 atmosphere uh, to work with. And turns out that that's enough to have your asteroid uh, create turbulence in the gas, and then with turbulent dissipation, and these were calculations uh, done by uh, Stu Pillars here at SETI Institute, he, he looked into this. Uh, with, uh, with turbulent dissipation, you can stop uh, a TC3-like spinning asteroid, so something going around every 100 seconds, you know, uh, with a sort of a uh, spin kinetic energy of, you know, two times, two, a few thousand joule, 
you can stop this thing in seven hours if you had an unlimited supply of xenon gas. In seven hours, so very quickly <laughs> for all uh, purposes. Of course, there isn't a lim limited amount of there is a limited amount of xenon gas, so the asteroids will start um, uh, s uh, will will start putting angular momentum into this gas. So at some point, the gas will start rotating; it will start co-rotating, and then uh, so some of that will couple with your enclosure. So your enclosure will start spinning, but uh, at such a s at such a low rate that you can compensate with fuel. You can use your engine to prevent the, uh, the enclosure from spinning. So what you're really doing is you're doing very, very gently, you're de-spinning your asteroid. This is the most gentlest way you could possibly do this. And so this is, this is feasible. And then uh, what you end up with is uh, none of this. So uh, you, you could actually have an asteroid that uh, is de-spun before you close your enclosure and before you try and grab it. Now that uh, should keep con keep you con give you control over your vehicle uh, throughout the whole process, so you don't lose contact with the Earth, and uh, you will, uh, uh, in principle, be able to bring that enclosure down very, very gently. Now, if is that gently enough? That's a question. <laughs> so that was bugging me because you may still end up with a pile of rocks, but in that case, it would be a pile of rocks that would be treated more gently. So you may uh, have more of that original. Um, structure and you may have more information on how that or, or how the original pieces were uh, will come together so we think that this was a, a practical idea of doing it uh, we know it works because we've put 0.1 atmosphere of gas in balloons in the past this was a, uh, a balloon that was flown by uh, um, uh, by, by Julian uh, not in uh, uh, during his flight over Australia uh, Julian is our um, ballooning expert, uh, so he loves this idea of putting a balloon in space. <laughs> uh, really, uh, really strange idea. The, the concept would be very much like ARM. You would use air beams. Uh, you would sort of uh, uh, make a V-shape. You'd go over your asteroid, and then you could try and close it. Uh, the most difficult part of the whole exercise is how you would close the asteroid, how you would gas seal the asteroid at the other side. And so we do not know yet how to do that properly. We've come up with some ideas. You could use uh, some sealing fabric. You could use sticky silicone layer and so on to, to keep it sealed. But this is, this is the engineering problem of the future, we think. This, is, this needs to be sorted out. How would you, how would you do this sealing of the, of the asteroid? And, and there may be alternatives. I mean, Rather than you know trying to seal it on the other side of the asteroid, you could sort of have two of two vehicles, and try and mate the two vehicles in the center. You know that would be an alternative approach. That may give you actually also more control over your spinning, uh, but you know um, uh, this is uh, this is something to to sort out. So if it's possible to do this, if you can make it a sealed enclosure, then uh, you have a practical way of despinning your asteroid. Uh, you would. Um, you would want to have a little bit more control over your vehicle, so instead of having big solar panels sticking out, which can flex and, you know, this a little bit dangerous, you would want to have uh, s solar, solar panels on your enclosure. Uh, you would have different albedos on different sides, so you could thermal thermally control your gas uh, inside and uh, all those things. So a lot of it turns out to be, you know, there are, pr there are ways to practically do this. Then, while we were sort of talking about this, uh, it occurred to me, you know, I'm Dutch. <laughs> we we uh, uh, are big in ships, and in the old days, you know, we used the wind to take us all over the earth. And the wind is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, so it, it occurred to us that if you have gas in your enclosure, uh, if you could circulate that gas somehow, you could set up a wind, and you could use the wind to blow the asteroid. This would be the, the most gentlest of ways you could think of handling your asteroid. And it turns out that this idea is in principle feasible as well. You need to uh, make a, a way of setting up a flow in your, a in, your, uh, in your enclosure. So the concept we had is you, you uh, have an inner tent and then you have an outer balloon and the space in between you use to pump back the gas. And uh, it turns out that you would need to pump around two cubic meters of the xenon gas per second around. If you can do that, then you could set up a four-knot wind, so we're talking gentle breeze, 
and uh, aim that gentle breeze at a one square meter surface point on your asteroid. And that's enough to uh, take the force of the, of the uh, solar electric propulsion engine and push against the asteroid and push the asteroid uh, in front of you. So that the ion uh, engine pushes the enclosure and then the wind pushes the asteroid. And that way you're basically literally blowing the asteroid to the Earth moon system. <laughs> It's thinking outside of the box, but this is a, a really good way of, uh, of manipulating an asteroid. The cool thing about it is that you have con complete control over what you're doing with your asteroid. So y at all times, you know, you have cameras, you can set up cameras all the way around the asteroid. You can, you can look and see what you're doing. You can keep track of where everything goes. If you dislodge material, if dust comes off and so on, it's all collected in your enclosure at places. Uh, this is uh, this uh, turns out it, that turns out to be also a way to control your enclosure because you can, in principle, control your enclosure with the um, with your armed vehicle, uh, but you can also uh, have high pressure vents and blow xenon gas into the enclosure as a way to you know uh, push off and uh, and keep the enclosure centered on the on the asteroid. So to for this to work, you need some pumps. You need to dedicate some xenon gas to your to this process. Uh, you need a computer system that uh, keeps your enclosure centered. And uh, you need a control system to know at all times where the asteroid is. So, so that would normally be a LiDAR system where you, where you measure the distance to the asteroid, but you could also maybe do it with the uh, various cameras around. So it it's comes from the ARM option A. It's a, it's a relatively minor modification of ARM option A. But it uh, gives you incredible ad, uh, adventure. So this was sort of the, the way that we saw the cameras and vents systems. It gives you the big advantage that you can actually bring an intact, frail asteroid to the Earth-Moon system. And then, uh, you know, have the asteroids interact with something that is really uh, the type of object they, they may one day meet. Uh, as, as in the future, um, this type of an effort would really make asteroid mining possible, I think. If you, if you, first thing you need to figure out, how do you put an enclosure around an, uh, around an asteroid? Uh, this is a great exercise to go and start do that. Once you get your enclosure made, uh, the limits, you know, the possibilities are endless. Uh, one of the options, for example, is you can use gases now to do the mining. You can actually have uh, sort of corrosive gases react with the metals in a meteorite and uh, that way uh, collect uh, co collect metals from your from your object, uh, and you can then use those metals in a in a way to uh, do three D printing and you know make tools. So you know, cool ideas. Bruce's Bruce's concept of uh, collecting volatiles from a from an asteroid would work. You you have your sealed enclosure. That means you can now can heat the the asteroid, and uh, you can uh, then collect whatever comes out, and you can use that as fuel for uh, for for spacecraft, and uh, you know one of the coolest things is I think is what you're doing is you're create you're creating a habitat around your asteroid. You're creating a bit of, with a tenth of an atmosphere of gas or build it up to one atmosphere of gas. Uh, you can keep water liquid, and that means that you could drench this asteroid with water, and you could actually use the asteroid material itself as a substrate for growing plants. So if there are if you, if you can think of ways of of doing something with an asteroid that takes a hard time you know bringing all that rock up from earth but it, it already being there if that's an advantage then uh, this type of uh, putting an enclosure around the asteroid uh, gives you uh, all the opportunities to go and 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 use that utilize that so this is our little uh, you know uh, part possible part to uh, to the future something that we think is practical and uh, maybe that uh, the arm uh, mission efforts will uh, will lead to this, will point us uh, to this path, and ultimately will uh, make us use these asteroids for uh, for space travel. Thank you. Okay. So, questions for our speakers? Thank you. My question deals with these Van der Waals objects being exposed to essentially nothing 
for a while, and then suddenly they've got a tenth of an atmosphere of xenon around them. Xenon is inert chemically, but as a medium, I mean, are you you, it seems to me you're going to end up just with a bag full of dust, aren't you? Won't you disperse all the, sort of d more or less destroy the van der Waals attractions? Uh, I don't think you destroy the van der Waals attraction, but you may affect its strength. And so this is said, yeah, this is so this is uh, something that needs to be investigated and see, you know, what uh, what what comes out. That's a very good question. I I had one that's similar, kind of overlaps. Um, when you start the phase of the capture of the asteroid and you start blowing stuff around and you would blow regolith, obviously, some of it, um, what, how would you keep track of the asteroid if, say, a lot of that dust settled on all your camera lenses and you couldn't see anything? Yeah, the, the nice thing is that uh, in for this problem, the technology has actually been developed. <laughs> So there are little uh, uh, electrostatic uh, systems now that uh, you know you you flip a switch and then poof all the dust is gone in front of your lens. Yeah. So uh, so this uh, this this problem we also thought about and we realized that it, that the technology already exists. Okay. More questions? Are okay. question came up, what is next? And it would seem that comets are going to be a target in the foreseeable future. Would an enclosure around a comet be about the only way you could bring back volatiles, I would think? I don't know if it's the only way, but it would definitely be a way. Yeah, the, um, it's interesting, uh, for example, what Rosetta uh, is doing at the moment is going to a comet when it's still far away from the sun, before it's really active, when its activity is low. At that stage, you know, you could put an enclosure around the comet, collect what you need, and then let the comet go. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, so there are yeah, there are uh, many possibilities here. If I can add to that, there are pro proposals for what we call cryogenic sample return from a comet. So you go out when it's much further from the sun than we are. All the water, ice, and maybe even the CO two is still frozen. You pick that up, you put it into a freezer, and you keep that box very very cold all the way back to Earth. This is a significant engineering challenge, especially if you want to bring it down to the ground, because you have to pack that freezer inside of a sample return container. But it has been suggested. So yes, in this case, you know, just like Stardust flew through the comet coma to collect dust, maybe this is a way to uh, easier way to collect the volatiles. Also, uh, it's asteroid day, and we have two asteroid guys here. So, if you have other questions unrelated to Arm or Shepard. Uh, this might be a good day to ask about asteroids in general. Is it practical to take a gas uh, chemotography device, you know, portable size available now, and to be able to do the um, experiment there itself before even it comes to the Earth and something would be destroyed otherwise? And there are other uh, uh, source based, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy based uh, um, diagnostic devices you can use to to get the volatiles or if there's any any liquid or any anything else, and that's available as a per thing, and <laughs> we can talk about it. Okay, there are proposals for doing lots of detailed in situ chemical analyses. I'm not aware of anybody doing gas chromatograph instrumentation for asteroid applications, but certainly there's been a lot of interest in the Raman spectrometers now that they're flight qualified. So when we'll, is to go to Mars in 2020, you can talk about doing that to an asteroid and doing detailed chemical analysis in situ. Okay. I'll ask a question. Um, so Almahata Sita. Um, the, uh, the one that fell in Sudan, that is a mixed bag, literally. Uh, so, how do you get that? What was the latest thinking? Uh, the latest thinking is that um, the the bulk of this asteroid was actually ur uralite, uralitic. So it's that black, scruffy stuff. Uh, only uh, sef seventy percent or so what fell on the ground was uralitic, but uh, but we think that an originally a lot much bigger percentage of it was. And the uralites come from a, a planet, uh, planetesimal that got really hot inside, but not hot enough to melt all the minerals. So it melted some minerals. They flew away, 
uh, right at the point when it was that hot, uh, it got it got smashed by something else, and the planet shattered. All those then pieces cooled very rapidly, so we see evidence of that in the rock. And then uh, those pieces came together again by gravity and rebuilt sort of this asteroid, if you like. Then somehow it migrated to the inner part of the asteroid belt, and there uh, it accumulated, we think, uh, these other types of asteroids. So we think that probably the percentage of these other types of asteroids more was more in the sort of the 1 to 2 percent range than, uh, than 30 to 40 percent as we saw it on the ground. But you know, still, it's still a lot of material to collect. And then this thing got hit again, smashed and created a, an asteroid uh, family. And uh, it's that asteroid family that's now uh, bleeding things via the resonances towards the Earth. Thanks. Uh, what's the um, uh, ratio between uh, iron-rich and carbonaceous uh, asteroids out there right now that we know of? So if you look at meteorite samples, you find that most of them are irons. This is a heavily biased sample for two reasons. One is the iron meteorites are relatively strong. They don't break apart into very fine dust anywhere near so much as the other ones that Peter mentioned. The other reason is that it's a lot more obvious that something is artificial. If you're walking around, you see a big chunk of steel sitting on the ground. So there's a very big collection bias. If we look at the asteroid population through radar observations, we can get a sense of the, which things are dense, very reflective to the radar, metal rich. And that's about 1 to 2% of the near-Earth population for larger objects. For smaller objects, we have less data, and it's not entirely clear if the compositions change with size. OK, so um, let's finish the public questions now. You can come up and ask the speakers if you have uh, any further questions. And as you s saw, there's plenty of issues about uh, collecting asteroid samples, and it would take lots of caffeinated be beverages before people sort it out. So here are the special SETI mugs uh, for experts to uh, you know, get caffeinated and think some more about it. Thank you. Thank you.